Okay, so I'm going to start with a question, which is um, how would you define sexual consent? I'm not looking for answers right now. Um, but most people, or many people, would think of it as a mutually enjoyable sexual encounter. Um, but what my research is examining is how ideas about consent are changing, how they're contested, uh -oh. there we go. how they're contested, how they differ across genders, and how they've been transformed by the Me Too movement. So today I'm going to talk about changes in our culture, our practices, and our everyday understandings of consent. So these changes, as um, you just heard, are part of a larger gender revolution, um, which is also resisted, and I'll explain that too. So over one third of women have had experiences with sexual violence, and almost one in five have survived rape or attempted rape. Yet research that's been conducted before the Me Too movement has found that over half of survivors did not acknowledge their experiences as sexual assault. This is especially um, the case when those circumstances in the situation d did not conform to um, what, we, what people think sexual assault looks like, okay? And these are um, stereotypical rape scripts, and they include things like um, a dark city street, um, a stranger and someone screaming, right? Those are sort of our stereotypes of what that looks like. And these are tropes that are reinforced in popular culture. So my research is um, finding that transformations that have recently take place in how people define and acknowledge sexual assault and consent have been very profound. So in the last several years, we've been hearing a lot in media and politics about accusations and consequences of sexual misconduct among celebrities, public figures, um, et cetera. The phrase Me Too was actually coined by community activist Tarana Burke here in her TED Talk um, in 20, 2006, excuse me, to raise awareness about sexual assault and to promote support for victims, particularly black women. So over 10 years later, um, in 2017 and 2018, it inspired social media activism when celebrity and actress Alyssa Milano um, popularized the phrase as a hashtag. So Milano's Me Too tweet, which spoke out about her own exploitative experiences with um, former film director and also convicted of offender Harvey Weinstein. What followed was a new awareness and the digital sharing of experiences by women across all kinds of industries and all kinds of life circumstances. In less than a year, the Me Too hashtag had been used over 19 million times on Twitter alone, and this number has only continued to grow and amplify. So the Me Too movement and um, this sort of, these ideas that we're gonna talk about is still very much alive within our laws, our cultures, and our practices. So today I want to introduce you to some average people and how they think about and experience these recent social changes. So transformations have happened not only among public figures, but also in the lives of ordinary people. So this is um, still partial and incomplete, but I call it a gender revolution because it exposes what really is a struggle for power, and also the deep cleavages that we see in society, culture, and politics. So to understand people's daily experiences, I conducted focus group interviews with 74 people from diverse backgrounds. Um, and so talking to those who both embrace these changes, as well as those who fear them, I learned why ideas about consent are so divided. The clash between traditional and innovative views of gender relations has led to contestation over consent. While some people continue to rely on traditional ideas about gender, Me Too has called these norms into question, and understandings of consent differ between genders. So let's unpack the idea of traditional heterosexual scripts, in which men initiate sexual activity and women act as gatekeepers. So while these, ex while these expectations in this, these roles may appear as if women set the boundaries about how far things are going to go, often women don't actually have power in these situations. Um, it's expected 
among many groups of people that men should push as far as they can or even try to persuade women to go past their boundaries. So before Me Too, um, research found that as a result of those kinds of power dynamics and traditional gender roles, about between one-third and two-thirds of women, depending on the study, um, reported agreeing to sexual interaction as a result of verbal sexual coercion, such as pressure or manipulation. Other research has found that young adults, in particular, rely on indirect um, language or interpretation of body language as indicators of consent. In other words, there's not a conversation. Um, it's more sort of guessing, guesswork. Um, in previous eras, policies and laws have centered on the agency to say no. So shifts are now taking place in how people view these issues, and it's leading to an increasing acceptance of what's called affirmative consent, which is more of a yes means yes standard. These changes have become codified in university and workplace policies around the country, um, and also in some state level laws. They're increasingly um, visible, and we increasingly have these ideas about um, the affirmative consent model. So California's law, for example, which was the first state to enact this kind of law, states lack of protest or resistance does not mean consent, nor does silence mean consent. Affirmative consent must be ongoing throughout a sexual activity and can be revoked at any time. So my study examined these ideas in focus group interviews with 40 men, 33 women, and one participant who identified as non-binary. Interviews primarily interviewees, excuse me, primarily talked about sex and gender within a gender binary in the context of heterosexual relationships. When examining attitudes, different perspectives emerged. Innovators are creating new expectations um, about what consent should be, and they're generating a new language that reflects women's agency and self-empowerment. Self um, in contrast, resistors espouse more traditional views um, and they push back against the innovative views. There are also people who fuse these two perspectives, so they kind of have some um, traditional and some innovative views. So this is um, some charts that show how the groups divided along gender lines. Um, so I have non-dominant genders, which is um, women and the non-binary interviewees, and they were much more likely to express the innovator perspectives than men. Um, so three quarters, in fact, were innovators. That's the blue, okay? Um, none were resistors. About a quarter expressed fused perspectives. That's the red. In contrast, about half of the men um, on the, is that your right? On your right, <laughs> um, were resistors, the yellow. Only one eighth were uh, innovators, the blue, and um, about one third had fused perspectives, the red. So in short, men were much more likely um, than non-dominant genders to see consent in traditional terms, while other genders were focused on more innovative perspectives. So let's talk a little bit about the resistors first. Um, most of the resistors saw men's definitions of consent as more loose and laissez-faire, while they saw women's definitions as more strict or textbook. One resistor called consent murky, implying that non-consensual behavior exists on a continuum. Um, they use phrases like extreme variance, black and white, textbook definition, or hard line yes and no to describe what they consider to be clear-cut cases of rape or sexual assault. In these situations, which draw on stereotypical rape scripts that we mentioned earlier, they thought that both parties would agree when sexual assault had taken place. Conversely, um, the resistors used phrases like lower level situations, um, lower level things, gray areas, stepping stones, and smaller things to describe what they consider to be lesser offenses. In claiming that these lower level things represent confusing situations, the resistors are actively contesting women's empowerment and self-determination. In example after example, resistors argued that men define harassment, assault, and consent differently than women. Um, these conflicting views set the stage for conflict today. 
And so one man said, for example, quote, there's a gray area where you're looking at sexual harassment, where you have to always be on your guard. A lot of women will be very textbook if something meets the definition of sexual harassment, whereas a lot of men will be more laissez-faire, unquote. This approach sets up gendered adversarial conflict over consent. Um, and suggests both awareness of the situation, but also a bit of defensiveness. In a context in which our definitions are shifting, some men realized, um, after talking about it for a while, that some of their own past behaviors would now be considered problematic, or maybe even classified as sexual assault. So when I asked um, a focus group whether people are thinking back to their past behavior and thinking, wait, I did such and such? One man replied, laughing, oh yeah, heck yeah. Although he may be looking at his past actions and seeing them in a new light, his laughter suggests embarrassment or perhaps making light of these serious issues. So as a result, um, many resistor men were concerned about what we have heard of and what they called false accusations. One said, I have family members and friends who've been accused of sexual assault. And, but they never did anything. One of my friends has a pending court case right now against him. I believe him that he didn't do it. Immediately following this comment, um, there was a, another resistor who agreed and described a situation where um, he was, uh, he felt that he was wrongly accused of sexual harassment in the workplace. And um, a lot of them, sort of made comments that they believe that women use false accusations to get back at other people. Um, but I just want to note that research on false al allegations and accusations indicate that actually its prevalence is quite low. So somewhere between 2 and 10 percent of reported sexual assault cases, um, and those are reported cases, so since only around 10 percent of cases are actually reported to the police, fewer than 1% of sexual assault cases could be classified as falsely reported. But resistors use the words like fear, danger, and scary to describe the potential career-ruining consequences of false accusations. And beneath this language lies a struggle for power, as women are increasingly rejecting abuses and reporting them and, or making them public, some men are pushing back against this. So false accusation claims reassert men's definitions of assault and harassment in gender traditional ways. For some resistors, public accountability has instilled fear of relationships. One said, that's something that I see in my peers a lot, is fear to even enter into a relationship for fear of false accusations happening at one point because of how public the Me Too movement is. While most men were innovators, uh, excuse me, resistors, one eighth were innovators, as I mentioned. Um, so one said, for example, there's a lot of men who try to point to these things and say, oh, look, anybody can be accused. There's a lot of men who really exaggerate these things and say, oh, I can't talk to any woman now because I'm afraid I'm going to be accused of this, this, and this. Those are the men that should be the most concerned anyways. If you have that attitude that your normal actions can be construed as sexual harassment and that you're going to be um, accused while innocent, you might want to examine the way you treat the opposite sex. You might want to examine the way that you yourself behave. Oop. Okay. Let's talk about the innovators. Um, innovators are expressing new standards of consent. One said, as a woman, you know what consent is. If you want to do something, you say you want to do it. This perception of non-dominant genders as agents of their own sexuality who affirmatively state what they want certainly conflicts with the traditional um, a gatekeeping role that we talked about earlier. Another said, it's not just because you say yes, all yes to everything. You have the right to say no in between and to say no about certain things or to be unsure about it. In a context in which public redefinitions are rapidly shifting, innovators of all genders viewed affirmative consent as the standard. One man said, for example, in the eyes of the law, you can never be 100% objective in determining whether or not someone consented. As a result, the definition should be left up to so those who are vulnerable. A part of it is still subjective. It's how you feel. 
If you feel uncomfortable, if you feel violated, the story ends there. It should stop. It should be understood that this is not what's going to happen. The platform created by Me Too um, brought these experiences out of the darkness and into the light. And assault was not viewed as um, an individual experience by the innovators, but more as a broad scale social problem. So um, although the focus group questions did not ask participants about experiences with assault, many of them shared them freely, illustrating an air of greater willingness to speak out even among a group of strangers. But rather than blaming themselves or other survivors, as was often common in previous eras, innovators transform the public discourse. One survivor said that assault should be, quote, defined as however you may feel. If you feel you were violated, if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel some sort of uneasiness about it, then that's what it is. You can absolutely define it how you want to define it. So affirmative consent, which deviates from traditional perspectives, is linked to women's empowerment more generally. Um, women are expecting their own autonomy, bodily and otherwise. And they even asserted the idea that a woman doesn't have to scream. She can whisper no. Um, they rejected the idea that pressure or manipulation is consensual. They also argued that anything outside of an enthusiastic yes represents sexual assault. Um, they went even further to argue that body language that conveys fear or lack of interest, interest indicates non-consent. One said, yes is yes, no is no. And there's phrases in between that may not mean exactly what you were hoping for, but it means no. So let's return to the question we started with, um, what is consent? And let's also consider where we're headed in the future. So on the one hand, clear changes have happened in how people view consent, and we're talking publicly about these issues more than ever before. On the other hand, sexual assault still occurs in large numbers. Um, in theory, an affir affirmative consent model assumes two equal participants who freely choose to engage in sexual behavior, and they communicate this and their agreement very clearly. In reality, however, we still have gender norms, and we still have persisting inequalities, and those interfere with the paradigm of consent. So when women and gender nonconforming people may still feel pressured as a result of gendered power imbalances, including being socialized to be nice. We need to continue to expand these conversations so that people can talk to each other, be vulnerable, and also have their autonomy respected. What's interesting is that although the innovators endorsed affirmative consent, most did not challenge the basic gender roles and norms inherent in heterosexual interactions. They still assume rigid gender differences in roles in which men initiate and women accept or reject their advances. So the language of yes and no assumes that men are asking and women are making a decision. Um, and the endorsement of affirmative consent is certainly a step forward, but um, it's also not articulating a new gender paradigm based on mutuality and equality. And so while these changes are still unfolding, um, a more equal and just society has the potential to emerge, right? It's, we're not there yet. Um, so though, although I call it a gender revolution, and that's clearly in the works, it's obviously incomplete, and there's obviously a lot of challenges to it. Um, and if you want to know more, my book is being released next week. <laughs> Thank you.